Ledford, and uh, I'm just a regular guy uh, that uh, is a theologian with a small T, and um, well, that's kind of like all of us, right? We're all theologians of some sort, and um, <clears throat> in my uh, spiritual uh, quest, I have uh, come to uh, Christian transhumanism, and with Christian transhumanism, I would say that uh, I pretty much alienated everybody. <clears throat> okay, yeah. yeah, but that's okay because I think it's a good place to be if you want to be original, right? You know, um, <clears throat> yeah, the the main sticking point is uh, faith and works. You know, with uh, most of my buddies that are Christians, they think that it's only by faith, you know, that we're saved. And then on the other hand, you got transhumanism where uh, it looks like uh, it's only by our works. But I see it uh, in my worldview as being a combination of both. Okay, that it takes faith and works. Um, have you ever heard of H plus? Okay, H plus is the transhumanist uh, logo. Oh, this is the one I wanted to submit, but uh, I, again, got shot down for that. <clears throat> As you can see here, it's uh, humanity raised to a higher power, okay? And uh, that's uh, in combination of uh, faith and works where I believe that this is happening. Because I really think that uh, what is happening when you just uh, deal with faith alone is that you lose the spirit of humanity. You lose the spirit and a categorization of the spirit I'd consider the Holy Spirit, the one that concentrates on growth and understanding, connections and love. <clears throat> now, uh, I don't want to go right here, right yet. I think I want to go to the very last slide. Let's see. And because um, um, here's all my slides. So I'm going to just go to end this way. Okay, I want to go to this slide right here just to get it uh, uh, to uh, kind of a uh, abstract of, of where we're going with Christian transhumanism. Now, <clears throat> this is a, uh, a sp not a space-time diagram, but an information-time diagram. And with an information-time diagram, uh, I'm looking at... Uh, a creation, I am looking at uh, chaos, and then I'm looking at a cognitive process and a growth of understanding, and, and then, uh, as we uh, have already, Mr. Givens uh, has said before, a, theos uh, a theosis or a growing back, a gathering up or ascension back to a, uh, a singular point. And in Christian transhumanism, uh, some people talk about the singularity. Is everybody familiar with the singularity and, and what that is? Okay, well, the singularity would be this uh, center section right here. And uh, then uh, that center section, I say, is a universal. It's a universal section or a state of being. A, uh, the ultimate perfected state of being that is the same whether or not it's an alien from another planet or it's uh, uh, another universe completely that there is this one state that we describe as, uh, as well I describe as Christ okay it's all knowing it's all creative it's a creative power now, that power right here in this uh, diagram, it's not a space-time time diagram, as I said. It's an information-time uh, time diagram. And let's go from this point, and let's think about the Nicene Creed, where in the Nicene Creed they say that uh, all things in heaven and earth are created through Christ. Okay? All right, now... <clears throat> Then put that with the Big Bang Theory. And with the Big Bang Theory, you have uh, what we know as uh, a, uh, uh, just uh, basically a creation of, of information. And the reason I use information here instead of uh, energy 
is because I want to lean from here on out on digital physics. Okay, I want to lean on uh, the fact that uh, many of our current scientists today believe that, uh, <coughs> that our reality, the material universe, is at its heart information. Okay, and there are ve very many um, well-respected scientists that believe that. It's uh, the current thought as far as uh, our uh, ground of being. So let's take that on out and let's say from here you have uh, uh, basically a chaos and then you have a condensation into matter and then from matter this uh, shifts off to where finally life is, uh, uh, emerges on the scene. And when life emerges on the scene then there is a sort of cognitive process that's going on that I like to call a growth in understanding. Now this growth in understanding is at its highest pinnacle when we get to uh, the, I guess you'd qual call it the quality of love, okay? And to love something, you've got to know it. And to know something completely, you have to love it. Does anybody know who said that? It was uh, Aldous Huxley in his book called The Perennial Philosophy. He did an anthology of all the great religions. And he said, you know, what we can, what we can uh, just basically boil love down to is we can boil it down to a cognitive process where at its peak is love. Okay? So that has a... a, a definite Christian flavor, I'd like to say, with that. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about it. I'll, I'll lead up to that. Now, here you would say, well, you know, this is life making this turn back in right here. And it's as a torus. I hope you guys have already seen that this, this uh, topographic really is a, is a torus, right? With a closed, infinitely small circle right here. At this point down here, they, it looks like uh, we need some batteries for this laser because uh, it's dying out. But at this point right up here, uh, we get to uh, what you might call our current society. In our current society, we have cognitive uh, evolution going on. We have actually, I would call it a, uh, a conscious evolution going on where we're able to uh, start to take control of our, of our own evolution. And now we get back to uh, what the Bible would say about this section right here, this lighter blue section that's gathering back up. Remember, this was from the Nicene Creed where they would say all things are created uh, through uh, Jesus Christ. On this end right here, we are uh, being gathered back up. And there's many, uh, um, there's many parts in the scriptures that talk about being gathered back up into Christ. I think it's Ephesians 1.11 is one uh, that I like to, uh, to lean on there. And uh, with that there, you get into Mr. Gibbons' uh, you know, theosis, where we are growing by faith and works back to this singular point where we all participate because we are all uh, going to experience the same sensation, the same feeling, okay? So, so this is information. This isn't matter. It's information, we're going to learn if I got enough time here, is disembodied. It's a, uh, it has actually got an external nature. And I can go into uh, uh, some papers by MIT uh, physicists that say, hey, you know what, we've gone as far as we can go in physics. And we know that uh, there's external realities. Uh, they talk about mathematics being a um, mathematics as being eternal, universal. Okay, always there, regardless, right? So, um, so that's what we're talking about here. Not material, but more of like an external reality and a process that's taking place. Uh, I think you could overlay process theology pretty well with that. Uh, so here we get back to uh, our first slide. Now let's build into this. 
And we'll build into it by uh, what I uh, put in my paper was uh, that Christianity, Christianity is the religion of the Logos. It's the faith in the Creator's spirit. And you might be surprised to know who said that. It was the Pope about uh, two or three months ago. He said that Christianity is a religion of the Logos and the faith in the Creator's spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit that looks at valuing life, enjoying life, and wanting to create more. Okay? So uh, what is this thing Logos? So Logos has an ancient meaning and it has a uh, more contemporary meaning in that it is word or reason. They identified it with the animating principle of the universe. You take it back to the Platonics and uh, even uh, with the perennial philosophy, it's the divine ground of being. So uh, the world, is it created from word? Well, what does the Bible have to say about that? It says that in the beginning, the world was the, word, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has not been made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Okay, disembodied information coming from an external reality which physics seems to be supporting. Okay, And then over here, I, I just wanted to show you uh, a space-time hypersphere, or a space-time uh, diagram, I should say, where you could say that space is a two-dimensional slice right here, and time is that third dimension in this drawing from uh, the Big Bang on out through uh, uh, what we know as far as expansion is concerned. External reality would be here, and internal reality is inside here. And I'll try to use that as a theme so that we can uh, start to um, uh, embody it. Another thing that uh, Christianity says, especially uh, the early church fathers, is that we become participators in Christ. This is why I can be a Christian transhumanist, is because there are plenty of places in the Bible that say we can be participators in this singular state of being. It's just, a, it's just a singular state of being, okay? It's hard to reach, but it could be reached. That's, that's our hope, that's our faith, okay? We participate in this divine. And how do we do it? By spiritual growth. Increasing in knowledge and understanding of the Word of God, decreasing your frequency of severity of sin, increasing your practice and qualities like uh, Christ like qualities, and your faith and trust in God. And I got this from uh, allaboutgod.com. That's spiritual growth, that's the works. Now, uh, the reason I'm here is because of this controversial idea that there's a Christian transhumanism way of looking at this world, okay? And this Christian transhumanism look at this world is to describe what is transhumanism. Uh, how, how much do I need to spin on this slide? Is there anybody that doesn't know what uh, transhumanism is as far as it supports uh, science and technological uh, application to mental and physical characteristics, try to reduce disability, suffering, and death, use technology as much as possible, uh, and then transform themselves into post-humans. So there's uh, the philosophy of transhumanism and post-humanism. Post-humanism would, would be that evolutionary uh, next step, okay? So I'm going to take us uh, to the simulation argument next because the simulation argument is a, uh, uh, it's a contemporary argument that they say is probably one of the best arguments for God that there is nowadays. And uh, I'd like to start with looking at uh, this graph that I think uh, Mr. Hughes probably knows quite a bit about. He's seen it all over the internet. 
and anybody that's been uh, researching uh, transhumanism knows that one of the things that we have as a, uh, a, a source of pride for man is on this scale right here, we have uh, uh, information, uh, millions of information, uh, is it mil information processes per second, okay? So what that means is, is uh, how fast the machine is, is actually processing over uh, our, our lifetimes, basically. The, well, from the 1900, actually, I guess, here to uh, 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 2010, and then goes to 2050. And it shows a continual increase. And in this case, it's a logarithmic scale. So you see that linear increase. Do I sound like uh, Kurzweil? OK, Not, well, I don't want to too much, but uh, that's uh, uh, where we are right now. Now, at this point right here, uh, there's a lot of doubt and there's a lot of faith in the transhumanist community that somehow or another we can bust past the uh, uh, limitations that are uh, coming up with uh, uh, computational computer type advancements because of the heat problem, because of software problems and one thing or another, uh, that we won't be able to continue this trend on out to actually be able to uh, um, get to uh, human intelligence. Well, uh, there's a, in the last week or so, there's been some news that's come out because uh, it seems that something always crops up that supports man, that gives us more hope. And the most recent is, is quantum computing, where they would use qubits not just uh, uh, binary bits, but qubits that you would uh, tap into the very uh, quantum state of, a, of an atom, of an electron, and from that be able to store uh, four times, eight times as much information, depending upon the quantum states that they uh, would tap into. And with this, uh, they're, they're talking about here in the next five years being able to uh, surpass the computational capabilities of, of our uh, current day computers, okay? There's hope, even in the transhuman. There's faith and hope in, with transhumanists, right? And uh, I put the, a lot of hope into this right now because it's gotten to the point where uh, there's a lot of naysayers that uh, lean on this trend of just binary computation and saying, you'll never get there from here. Quantum computing? we will be able to get there from here because quantum computers do a timeless calculation, okay? Now, this gets more into um, the Holy Spirit aspect right here where I put this overlay in that uh, I think the best hope for humanity is to hitch a ride on the computer processing. And in the last couple of weeks, they've been talking about this new term called co-processing, brain co-processing, augmenting our ability to sense things, our memory, our uh, just basically cognitive process uh, with co-processors, okay? And at first, where would they apply this? They're first applying it to, um, how are we doing for time? Okay, we're good. Uh, we would be able to, uh, uh, up, they're going to apply this mostly to people with uh, ep epilepsy, where they would have uh, um, a sensor that would see that you're getting ready to have an epileptic fit. There would be a processor along that, and then an, an, an input. So it's an input-output type of thing. It's part of you, okay? So I, I said we'd uh, uh, like to look at uh, more of this digital physics and this disembodied information as being the, the ground of being that physicists are coming up to. Digital philosophy and digital physics are uh, the current state of affairs with uh, many of our leading physicists and scientists. And at the end of this, if you'd like to see it, I've got a list of some very impressive scientists that say that at the physical processes of nature or forms of computation, 
and the processing is the most fundamental level of reality. Biology reduces to chemistry, which reduces to physics, which reduces to conformational, comp, well, let me say that, computational information. Okay, all changes in physical nature are consequences of digital information processes. Okay, that's digital physics. Now, given what we saw with the trends of computers, given what we've seen with uh, co-processing that's been going on, uh, let's uh, talk about uh, Mr. Bostrom, Mr. Nick Bostrom and his simulation argument. Okay, I've, I've thrown this in here because it's a, it's a controversial thing, but it uh, is uh, it's worth talking about because it's interesting and it, it could fit into Christ, uh, this Christian transhumanism. What it's saying is, is that we, uh, given a, a few um, assumptions, that uh, if you look at the fact that we are actually uh, uh, going to uh, enter a post-human phase, let's assume that. Let's also assume that we will continue to play SimCity, that we'll continue to model, uh, like in my case, uh, nuclear power plant operation, or one thing or another, that we would actually uh, grow to the point where we could simulate whole universes. Does that sound outrageous? At this moment, millions of people are running simulations. It's likely, uh, is that likely to stop in our post-human phase? Or will there be a chance that, I, I, I talked to a few guys earlier this, today, that there's maybe a 20% chance that we're living in a simulation now. That there's an external reality, there was a creator, and that that creator is, uh, you know, watching us do what we're doing here, right? And to what, uh, to what ends? Well, that's uh, my theology with a small t, okay? And I'll come up to that in a second, I hope. Okay, so here, uh, just to show you the plausibility of this and that it's, it is actually uh, not, not only plausible, but it's coherent and that it uh, fits with our reality as we know it today, so it is... Uh, uh, not too far out there. Here's a simulation of evolved galaxies uh, that we're doing. Okay, right here is the noise of the, of, uh, of the uh, fundamental constants of, of nature and this internal reality that was generated and, uh, by the Max Planck uh, Society in Germany. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and bring that little dot right there make it a little bit bigger, make it a little bit bigger, make it a little bit bigger, and the Millennium Run has simulated a galaxy. Okay? Now, with this, what we're talking about is just the matter, you know, and, and that, okay? And uh, so from here on, I have to uh, just basically flip through the slides here real quick. And give me about, uh, what, just five minutes maybe? Less than that, okay. Uh, here's the Blue Brain Project. Here I am running a external reality, in my external reality, running a simulation at the Palo Verde Nuclear Power Plant. Here I am uh, uh, now in that, and I see that uh, I can uh, create minor miracles for these guys at this nuclear power plant. There's my shiny head over in the corner. Um, there's the, the power plant as a whole. And from there, I, I see that uh, there's, there's really um, a good argument for a creation, a creator, an external reality, and, um, and miracles, that there can be miracles. And I guess I'll just go ahead and leave it there. So thank you very much.